Now all over this house, will you put your hands together and lift your voice up and give Jesus the highest praise you've given him all morning? Oh, come on. We can do better than that. The Bible says clap your hands, all your people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on. They got louder than this in the Tennessee-Alabama game last night. Amen. Let's give God glory. He's far better than a football game. He's far greater than a birthday party. He's far greater than an accomplishment. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. It is so good to have you at Northwoods Church this morning. Northwoods, will you give every visitor today, we have a big hand of appreciation. We have a lot traveling this morning out of town, so if you will keep those in your prayers. We have a family watching online. Can we give our online family a big hand this morning? Thank you, team. I've got a very, I'm not going to call it short word, because you know how preachers are, ain't nothing short with preachers, but our IQ. But I do have a, what I feel to be a very direct word for myself. And I felt led to speak on it this morning and challenge you as a follower of Christ, not just Northwoods Church, though I believe Northwoods Church is responsible for the ministry he has given here. But no matter where you are or where you go to church, I believe that we could all hear this word and walk forward in it. Amen. In the name of Jesus. If you have your Bible this morning, we got a whole lot of scripture we're going to read. In the book of Job. In the book of Job, chapter 42. Nobody read the door. It's Job. Not job. The book of Job. When you find it, I'm going to ask one more time if you'll please stand in reverence for the reading of God's holy word. Job chapter 42, verse number 10. It'll also uh, be on the screen for you if you need it. Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Will you stretch your hands for me? Pray for me as I pray for you. Most wonderful and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, what a joy and a privilege and an honor it is, Lord God, to come together with brothers and sisters, having the liberty and the freedom that we have, to come together and to worship you. Father, I pray that this morning, God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would lead us, guide us, and direct us through the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Father, that we would accept the conviction that we would allow the challenge to operate in us, Lord God, and that we change prevail. Father, I ask you right now to give us wisdom and knowledge for your word, and we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Let every ear be anointed to hear, every mind be anointed to understand, and every heart made ready to receive, Lord, what you are speaking to your people. We give you the praise for it in Christ's name. And the church says, amen. You may be seated all over the house. Shake somebody's hand as you're being seated and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the turning point. Amen. The turning point. Uh, as I was preparing this week and studying, I've been, I've been all through the book of Job. And there, there's multiple, multiple things that I want to dig into and want to study and uh, just, I, I'm not ready to preach some of those yet because, I, like I said, I want to dig a little deeper and I want to, I want to prepare. But I got to the end of the book of Job and reading chapter 42 and I got to verse 10 and I love that it says, "And the Lord turned the captivity of Job, of Job, turned his basically he turned his issues, he turned his directions." And before we get too much into this, I want to talk about turning points for a moment. Anytime we are traveling a highway or we're going through life, every person in this room, at some point in your life, multiple times in your life, you are going to come to a crossroads. You are going to come to a 
moment that you are going to have to make decisions. It is impossible to live in this life and not make decisions. You are going to have to make decisions. And the, the, the road you're traveling, there's going to be some days that it's going to require you to turn a little bit. I know what the Bible says when it says straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leadeth unto everlasting life. I'm not talking about how to get into heaven and how to get to the Father. There ain't but one way, and His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. You can't get there any other way but through the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm talking about as you travel through life, serving the Lord. There's going to be some times in your life you're going to have to make some decisions. I'm going to give you an example, and I'm not... I, I, this is just a parable example, so I don't want you trying to think, who is it that he's talking about? This is just a parable example. This is just something to give you an idea. But I want you to put yourself in the, in the shoes as being a CEO. And you're in this company, and the company has to make a decision. You've got two ways to go. You can partner with this company who is international, but they've only been established for a few months. But, but, but looking at their numbers, it's projected that they are going to explode. And if you will partner this company, if they explode, you are going to make it, I mean, big time in, in just the blink of an eye. But then you've got this other partner that's, that's not so spread out over the globe, but they, they've been established for hundreds of years, and, 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 and they've continuously been a growing company. But it's going to be a slower progress and a slower build. And you're the CEO, and now the ball is in your court. And it is up to you on which direction you are going to take this company. Which way do you go? Just think about it for a moment. There's not a wrong answer. It's a decision. You don't know what the future holds. You're making a decision. Everybody that would have went with the international kind of new founder, will you just lift your hand? All right, all right. There's nothing wrong with that. Now for those that would have went with the slower progress, but has been established for a lot longer, all right, there's nothing wrong with that. See, you was at a crossroads and you had to make a decision. And when you make a decision, the decision you make is going to determine your future, your next steps. And it doesn't, and that little scenario, like I said, it wasn't a trick question. There's no wrong answer. You might have went with the, with the international one, and they might have expanded, and 200 years later, that might be the established business. Or you might would have went with the slow progress and looked over your shoulders, and that one crashed, and, hey, you made a great decision. Either way, I just wanted to give you the example because when you walk through this life, Serving God, not just business. There are going to be decisions you make. You say, well, Brother Josh, it's going to be easy because I'm going to pray about it, and I know what, I, I'm going to know what to do. I might be the only one in this room, but I have prayed about decisions before, and still to this day, I ain't sure I made the right one. I feel like I ended up exactly where God wanted me to end up, but I don't know that I took the right roads to get I don't know that I took, yes, God made all things work out for his good, but it didn't mean that I didn't have to go through some speed bumps and some school zones and some speed traps when there was a wonderful interstate right there that would have got me here a lot faster. When you come to crossroads, there are going to be at least two choices, but there's going to be sometimes that there's multiple choices. If you believe that you are going to live in this life and never have to make a decision, because you're saved, you have already deceived yourself. Because the, the fact that you are saved is, a, is an example and a fact that shows you it takes a decision. Love of God who chooses to love us. You have to make the choice to accept that love. And then you have to walk out your soul salvation with what? Fear and trembling. And you don't understand. Maybe you do, but there, you don't just know how many times that I, I get re I'm getting ready for a Sunday morning service. And I'm at a crossroads. And, and I've, I've been studying for this. But for some reason, I'm, I'm being nudged to go this direction. And in the last moment, I'm having, to, I'm having to just rattle my cage and shift everything around and get 
get, get this because I feel like the, the, the Lord is, is steering me this direction. Those are decisions. I, wouldn't, I would never be wrong if I come here and preach, hey, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He gave his son for you. That's a great message. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what sinners need to hear to come to, no, to the knowledge of the saving grace of Christ Jesus. But just like I preached on a few months back, there has to be a choice, not just by a pastor, but by every Christian to mature. Because what has happened is where the church is supposed to be a body of believers, all from different members of the body, from, from the, the different gifts that he gives the church, from, from apostolic ministry to prophetic ministry to evangelistic ministries to pastors and teachers. The, the church is supposed to come together and have all of these things. You know, when, when, when God calls me to, to prophesy, that isn't the street and start my prophetic ministry in a different building. God calls me to with an apostolic anointing and I'm supposed to go around the corner and start my apostolic holiness church. Or when God calls me to be a preacher in town and tell them they need to book me and pay me and get me a motel room and, 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 and give my family vacation trip so that I can go around and preach revivals. Or pastors and teachers, I'm not supposed to go start my own thing, but the church itself, every local should be operating in the fivefold ministry. But the problem is, is the church that was designed to be the strong arm of the church for discipling people has now become the soul saving ministry. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? Well, I mean, what's wrong with that? The difference is, is people are supposed to be getting saved on your job site. People are supposed to be getting saved at ball games. People are supposed to be getting saved at the banker's window. People are supposed to be getting saved in Walmart and Bass Pro Shops and out there fishing and hunting. People are supposed to be getting saved at hunting camp. People are supposed to be getting saved at barbecues. You shouldn't wait till Sunday morning and say, well, if the preacher preaches good, maybe my cousin will get saved. Lead that joker to Christ right there. Then you bring them into a local body with a five-fold ministry operating, and we can disciple, and we can mature, and we can grow. But the problem is, is somewhere down the road in history, the mentality came that as long as the priest, as long as the pastor would teach Teach them, they will learn when every single one of us in here are on the same playing field. The Bible says go out into the highways and the byways and compel people into the house of God. How am I going to do that? I can't go out there and sprinkle pixie dust on them and say, get into the house of the Lord. You know, I could probably go out there and stick a pistol in their back and say, you're going to church, buddy. How do I compel someone into the house of the, of the Lord? I have to make a decision. I wake up to be intentional about how I walk out my day and how I walk out my life. And that is asking the Holy Spirit to lead me and open doors of opportunity. I don't want to wait till someone comes to church and hope that they get saved there. I would rather lead them to Christ on the way to the church service. And when we get in the church service, they already take their first step in maturity. The church is designed to equip the saints. But we've made it the soul-saving arm of the ministry. So we've lost our ability for discipleship. I was talking with someone yesterday, and, you know, and because of this, this is one of the methods that I have is, you know, on Sunday mornings I feel like Paul sometimes, and that's not because of everybody, but Sunday mornings is typically, go typically going to be the Sunday or the, or the service that, most of your visitors are going to attend. People that don't originally come to church may show up on a Sunday morning. So you kind of got to be like Paul when he's talking to the Corinthian church. He says, man, I got so much holy stuff I want to share with you guys, but I can't do it because you're bathed in Christ. You can't handle what is holy, so I got to teach you again the small things. I got to go back to the beginning and teach you salvation. I got to go back to the to the beginning and, and, and remind you of what grace is. I got to go back to the minute. You're not walking in grace. You're not walking in mercy because you're not maturing in Christ. So I got to keep going back to grace and mercy. And we never get to the part where he says, be ye holy for I am holy. Where he says, obey my commandments. Where he says, you know, walk in the light of Christ. Walk in his, his commandments. Walk in his judgment. Walk in his thing. We don't get to that point sometimes in discipleship because we have to go back to grace. But on Sunday night Bible studies and Wednesday nights, 
that's typically where we're able to dig in and dissect the Word of God. And I've told people many times, I love to preach. I love it. I really do. I love coming here on a Sunday morning, getting music and worship, and you know, going on and all that. But if I had to choose, hey, man, you're only going to be able to have one or two services this week. Which one are you willing to give up? I would rather give up a Sunday morning service than a, Bible, or than a Sunday night Bible study or a Wednesday night. Because the Word is dissected, and it is, it's challenging. It pricks your heart, and it, and it says, are you willing to swallow what is put in front of you? But see, there has to be a turning point, and I, I'm going to get to the Word here in just a moment uh, from Joe's life. But see, God spoke to him, and he says, Josh, there's some things, talking as a whole, not just Northwood, but as a whole, that the church is going to have to make some decisions on. You know, I was, I was asked by someone during the election if they could come put signs out in our church. And I said, no, absolutely not. I said, because this isn't a political Because I want to see everybody from non-voters to Democrat voters to independent voters and Republicans all come to know the same Jesus Christ. And I'm not, we're not, this isn't the place where we make it about that. This isn't a place where we open the door and let the enemy come in and, and, and slide a divisive tool right in the middle. Uh, this is not the place where we come in and we talk about the laws of man and what if we can just do. There ain't a law in this change that is man-made that's going to fix this up. For instance, Roe versus Wade being overturned. It looks like a victory, but the law doesn't change anything. The law doesn't change anything. People were doing it before then. People were doing it after then. And they will continue to do it. The problem is the sin nature that is accepted in birth and never touched and never put of what brings upon a genocide, what brings upon a holocaust uh, of anybody, of any man, of, whether it be a baby or a man or a Jew or a Gentile, what brings that on the problem? We're going to be redeemed. Jehovah God, amen. Be careful that you don't, you, you don't worship a party rather than the kingdom of God. Be careful that you don't make the gospel of Jesus Christ take a back seat to your political agendas. This is an opportunity for us to stand up and to tell the whosoever. In other words, he don't care where you came from or what you did, but tell so ever will that they will hear the word that they will be saved because Jesus gave, our God gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe will not perish but have everlasting life you know you're going to see gay people that went to heaven because they got saved and changed their life you know you're going to see child molesters make it to heaven because they got saved and changed their life you know you're going to see murderers that make it to heaven because they got saved and changed their life no they won't well, let me ask you something you think David made it to heaven he murdered. He committed adultery and then had her husband killed. These things all throughout culture. Acts chapter 2. When you step into a when you step into the book of Acts, most churches can tell you about Acts chapter 2. But very few of them know what happened in Acts chapter 1. Why did Acts chapter 2 take place? And then what was Acts chapter 2 a spark for? It was a spark for Acts chapter 3. And when, when Peter would find himself in jail in Acts chapter 4, it was an opportunity that they could pray and that, that he could be set free from prison. Amen. And then it would be down the road when Stephen would be standing before Gentiles, Paul being in the presence, Saul of Tarsus at the time, he would see Stephen stand up and say, I, bought, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. Amen. And he says it so gently and peacefully. And the Bible says then he fell into a sleep. Amen. He was martyred with a smile on his face. He was martyred. Why? Because turning points happen in their life. People made decision that, yes, everybody thinks we're crazy. I should have been at work, but Jesus told me that if I'll tarry in the upper room, amen, that, that he was going to send a comforter. I'm not going to give up on the promise God gave me. One day passed, three days passed, a week passed, nothing happened. But 
on that tenth day, amen, the Bible says there came a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the room, and cloven tongues of fire sat upon each and every one of them, and they began to speak in another tongue, and the people outside heard them in their own language, thinking that they were drunk. Turning points. Job, chapter 42, verse 10, says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. God was telling me that in my prayer, I feel like God is wanting us to, to turn our focus and our attention away from what's attractive. Turn our focus in a is calling and do the one thing that is always successful. The kingdom of God. It can give you people. People about tell people about how he got how how he came into this earth. Tell people uh, where he was born, who he who he was, who was his mama and daddy. How was he conceived? Amen. And that's gonna pique people. I tell you, I don't know about you, but uh, I find my kids oftentimes like. Catchy stories. Man, what, how do you, you tell somebody, that man, there was this woman. She was pregnant. They going to kill all these babies. They run. She, she finds out she's pregnant first and foremost, and she runs to her, 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 her cousin's house. And just by saying, hey, how are you? A baby leaps in her cousin's womb, and she's filled with the Holy Ghost. See, everybody talks about Acts chapter 2. Don't nobody know about, amen, about when Mary goes over there and meets her, her cousin that she was filled with the Holy Ghost when the baby leaped in her womb. And, and, but that's a story for another day. There was a turning point in time. And turning points are a nature of walking in this life, preparing for that one. Turning points. There are going to be times that you are going to have to turn and the group you are turning, the group you're walking with isn't going to want to turn with you. you got to be okay turning by yourself. You the way you think they do. They can put all hearts on your, your Facebook and, and, and Instagram and Twitter. They, they, you, they want to. It don't mean that everybody you walk with is for you. Amen. There are going to be times when you're going through trials and tribulations like Job and your friends are going to come to you and they're going to tell you that you must have been something must have been wrong in your life. That's why you're going through the trouble you're going through. That's why you ain't serving God. You ain't as close to God as you thought you was because you're going through problems. And little do they know that God just had a conversation up there with Satan and said have you tried my good and faithful servant Job he is perfect and pure and there ain't nobody else like him in the world while that group was over there Job's in a turning point of his life and his friends are coming over there saying you need to repent Job you need to repent something's going on in your you got some secret sin going on in your life Job done lost his kids, he done lost his riches, he done lost everything that he ever known. He was a rich, successful man, and not only is he, it, what, did he lose all of his riches, now he's losing his health. His body's covered in boils and so, sores, having ash, and, and he's hurting, and he's, he's doing, and his own wife looks at him and says, Job, will you please curse God and die? Will Please put an end to this. That's all you got to do is curse God and die. And I love what Job said. Job said, naked. I came into this world naked. I'm going to leave this world. He said, but I am not going to curse God. I will bless his name. Amen. For he is good. Hallelujah. I'm getting a little excited. I'm going to get back to my point. Job. Horrible, horrible problem in life. And I can't help. Look at the root of it. And me and Charlie talked last night, but I had, I had something totally separated for this morning. And I couldn't get it off my heart. But I look at the root of Job's problem. And it had nothing to do with Job. Do you know why Job was chosen? Because he was pure. He was righteous. He was a man that walked out what he preached. 
See, turning points are very important to us as believers, especially new believers or new converts. Because there are a lot of people that can talk about this right here. There are a lot of people that can even muster up an awesome sermon out of this right here. But see, the Bible didn't say judge a tree by its bark. The Bible tells of what orchid is in. I've never seen one in my life. But it is an oak tree and a pecan tree split, grows together in one trunk and splits off. One side produces pecans, the other side produces acorns. Never in my life have I ever seen that before. But the Bible never says judge a tree based on where it's planted. But see, there's a lot of people that do that. Oh, he's planted in the seminary. He's got a tie and a Bible and a degree, and he's got an ordination on his wall. Oh, oh, she's blessed and highly favored. She'll tell you like it is, like it needs to be told. She's just blunt and to the point. She must be holy and pure and righteous. The Bible says judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. Even those closest to him were suffering, watching him suffer. They didn't come to him and boastfully and be like, oh, Job, you must be a sinner. I knew what you, I told you not to buy that donkey from that guy. He was a drug dealer and you just helped him. That's what you get. They didn't come around boastful like that. They were, they were suffering because he was suffering. And they just wanted to fix the problem. And a lot of times we're guilty of that. You see somebody going through something, especially men, we fix, we are fixers. We want to fix it. Can I tell you one of the most horrible pet peeves I have? Is people that are, that are talking to somebody that's going through something difficult in their life, and they always have the answer. I, either I am a horrible pastor and way behind the eight ball, or I'm going to be honest with you this morning and tell you, I don't always have the answer. I don't always know if everything's going to work out for you the way you want it to. But what I can tell you is if I can lean over there with you and you lean over there with me and we'll grab our hands together and I'll put my faith with your faith and we'll pray and put it in the hands of Christ, we will never go wrong. I can't tell you that it's going to take 42 chapters I, can't, I don't know if it's going to take you 42 chapters before you get turned around. I don't know. You might get turned around immediately. It might take 42 chapters. But 42 verse 10 is on the way. And God and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Why? Because he prayed for his friends. Oh, my God. The Lord is telling us, Josh, if you are ever going to move forward and you are ever going to continuously walk in my purpose and not plateau, but to continuously mature and come to know me until the day you meet me, if you never want to plateau, you are going to have to get to the place where when you are going through the most difficult moments of your life, that you've got enough faith that I'm still God, that I'm still in control, that instead of worrying about where you are headed, pray for the God that's over here worried about you worrying. Pray for the one that's over here worried about what you're going through. Pray for the one that feels defeated because you look defeated. And the moment that you rise up, your friends are going to be in the audience, amen, watching you get blessed.
and they're going to be blessed. A turning point for the church. That's why I, I spoke to Charlie. He knows what I'm talking about. This discussion of the root of the problem of Job's life is Satan said, if you will let me touch something that is so pure and so holy. you got a, you got a hedge of protection around him, his finances, his riches, his land. But if you will remove it and let me do it, I will make him curse you to your face. God said, you can touch it. You just won't take his life. This man comes up there and says, oh, man, while we were out there, this happened and now all the oxen are gone. Oh, and then while, while Job's getting this bad news, he, this other one runs up and said, oh, while this was going on, all the sheep got killed. Oh, and this other guy runs up at the same time. He's like, oh, while we were out there, all your riches in your land is going to be taken, and I'm the only one that escaped to come tell you. And then while he's hearing all this horrible news, I done lost my whole business, my whole family business. And while he's hearing this, this other guy runs up and says, Job, all your kids were in one house together, and they were drinking wine, and then winds came so hard and hit the four corners, and it fell down, and all of them are dead except me. I survived to come tell you. In a moment, he lost everything. Why? Because the enemy said, I, if I touch this hope and pure and put my step on it, I can change what he sees you as. That ain't, you ain't getting it yet. I'm going to help you out a little bit. If you go all the way back now through church history, the enemy said there's a church that is so pure and so holy. But if you will let me on the inside to touch this and touch that, I am going to take what is pure and I'm going to blemish it with impurity. And I'm going to blemish it with impurity. And before you know it, we're going to have white churches and black churches. We're going to have Democrat churches and Republican churches. We're going to have youth services and all old churches uh, and we're going to divide everything uh, and we're going to do it in the name of the gospel and we're going to stand up with this Bible and we're going to preach love while we hate each other we're going to stand up in this gospel and we're going to talk about the life giving God as we take life uh, we're going to stand up with this word and we're going to tell people worship God and let there be no other gods before him and we're going to allow idolatry to creep into our pulpits and we lift up men instead of Jesus Christ we lift up women instead of Jesus Jesus Christ. We see souls get saved and we glorify a preacher instead of Jesus Christ. Amen. But I'm here to tell you, the Bible told me, I don't know what it told you, but the Bible told me that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a church without spot and without blemish. So what does that tell me? There is a chapter 42 coming to the church. But we've got to remain faithful. When everybody else says it's okay to live like this, James, amen. Go, go to James chapter 1, verse 12 for me. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is died, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. If you will go on and... And read out through the book of James. Let me find out. I got it right here. Verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And keep himself unspotted from the world. See, our religion ain't a bad thing. Religiosity is a horrible thing. But all religion ain't a bad thing. James tells us about a pure religion and undefiled before God. It's one that visits the orphans and the widows in their affliction and that keeps himself unspotted from the world. In other words, though the enemy may have approval from God to come in and to do this, I believe God has enough hope in his children that they will establish themselves on the word. And when things come in to defile the temple, when things come in to defile what is holy, when things come in to defile what is pure, that we will be able to be like Job and say, naked I came, yes, I lost a whole bunch of members, but naked I came into ministry, naked I'm going to leave ministry. Yes, I lost a whole lot of friends, but when I came out of sin, I was brand new into this thing. And brand 
brand new. I'm going to leave out of this thing. Amen. I lost a bunch of family members because they didn't think I'd ever be able to change. But here I am today in chapter 42 of Job. And I'm getting a blessing, a turnaround in my life. As the musicians come and I get ready to close, what turning points have happened in your life? And this is the challenge. We could do one of many things. We could say, yeah, I'm, I get it. I have to be an agent of change, and I'm going to pray with you, Pastor. I'm going to agree with you in prayer. Look, that's great. I appreciate it. But I believe there's more we can do. There has to be a turning point. There has to be a turning point where some morning service is less about the fellowship, is less about the excitement of who sees your new shoes, less about serving a position or title, and more about serving the community of saints. The turning point that says, though the world may call it pure, what does the Word of God say about it? Though the world may say it's innocent, what does the Word of God say about it? What does God, what is God asking of me to do? There, I just want to give you a little glimpse into what, what it's going to look like at the very end of this thing. Imagine you are standing in the background, and there is a booth that says, Money Infinity. And over here, it says, Debt, you owe infinity. And before the people are let in, Common sense says everybody's going to run to the booth that they're going to gain money, not owe money, right? But as they start coming in, you realize that for every 15 or 20 people that come in, only one goes to the, the, the line that says in, they're going to gain money. Everybody else keeps lining up at the booth that says owe money. And you, you ask the director standing there beside you, why are all of these people coming in? And for every 50 of these, there's only one that comes over here. And the director says, well, they don't have a choice at this point when they're let in. Outside, they were given an option. If they would do this, they would receive an infinite blessing. But they could have blessing where they were at that was temporary. But then they would owe something beyond these gates. The Bible says, straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leadeth unto everlasting life. And the Bible says it just like this, and few there be that find it. It said, but broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that. The Bible tells us that hell enlarges itself daily. It is not God's will that any should perish. Can I tell you that there has never been one human being that God has ever sent to hell? If I go to hell, I went there on my own decision. Because the Bible tells me that when God created hell, he created it for and his fallen angels. It was never meant for men. But there are so many people that have never accepted the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ over their life. And frankly, please love me when I say this, but the church has not done a real good job of taking the gospel beyond the Sunday morning service. But we could go out today. We can make a decision right now.
to be a Job 42, chap, uh, of Job chapter 42, verse 10 in somebody's life. You might be the answer that somebody right now is praying for. You might be the answer. You might be the blessing right now that somebody's praying for. But I don't want you leaving here, going out there out of curiosity saying, was you praying for me? Is this really what you needed? No, you just go do what God asks you and let Him receive the glory of everything done beyond that. And as you do that, you are going to see a shift in the glory that is given unto God on a Sunday morning service. When you wake up and make your life intentional about serving God, intentional about getting to know Him in a relationship where you talk to Him, speak in His language, just, this is His language right here. This is what He knows. I'm not talking about His translation. I'm talking about His Word. When you speak to Him His Scriptures, He is bound by His Scriptures because He is not a man that He can lie. So when you pray in the Word and you pray to the Word and you pray knowing the Word lives on the inside of you, the Word grows and matures and becomes stronger and stronger and stronger in your life. But just like Job, the enemy wants to make impure what is pure. And he will do it in the name of holiness. He will do it in the name of church. He will do it in the name of gospel. I mean, whatever. You have to be on guard, protecting yourself from the schemes of the devil. And if you would do your part, I promise you, God's never going to fail on his. Will you stand all over the house this morning? The turning point. I read James chapter 1, verse 12 to you. And it tells us that, you know, we're going to have to endure temptation. But if we will endure it, we shall receive a crown of life. If you go on and keep reading, there's instruction on how to endure. You ready for this? I'm not going to give you the scripture, but I'll give you a hint. It's James chapter 1. He said, don't be just a hearer of the word only and not a doer. He said, because if you were just a hearer, you were like a man that beheld himself in the glass or the mirror. And when he walked away, he forgot the man that he was. He said, but if you be not just a hearer of the word only, but become a doer, that thing becomes established in you. So what goes in here has to go through here and right here. And when you start being the hands and feet of Jesus, people are going to be like, I have seen the Lord. Not because they've seen you, but because they've seen the Lord in you. I used to ask people all the time, why won't God just show himself? And I can think of a story in the Bible. One man said, Lord, let me see your face. He said, you can't see my face. I like to think of God as a big goof off sometimes, like joke, likes to joke around like I do. You, I can't let you see my face, Moses, you'll die. But get in the cleft of that rock. When I tell you to look, I want you to look. And when the Lord passed by, he let him look, and the guy was just mooning him over there. The Bible said he let Moses see his hinder parts, his backside. He wasn't literally mooning him. But the Bible says that when he came off the mountain, he glue. He, he was br shining bright with the glory of God. And all he did was see his hinder parts. You ever seen that glow in somebody's face when they get to know Jesus Christ for the first time? You can help that glow stay there by being the hands and feet of Jesus. Don't just hear the word on Sunday morning and be faithful to church service. I appreciate your faithfulness to church service. I really do. I would be doing a horrible job.
told you that was all there was to it. But you're supposed to take the word that you hear and apply it to your life and work it out there. I'm supposed to do it. We're all supposed to do it. Amen. I want to pray for you this morning. And I'm going to ask them to just lead us in a song of worship. And then these altars are always open if you need to come down for prayer. We've got men and women that would be glad to pray with you. If you need to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, please come see me. I will, I will help lead you. If you don't know how, I will help lead you. It is very simple. It is just an act of acceptance of what is already there for you. Father, I just ask you right now in the name of Jesus that you would just bless these people, Lord Father, from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, God. Father, you see them in their struggles. You see them on their mountaintops, God. You know their ends and their outs. You know their ups and their downs, God. And you love them through it all. But Father, you have asked of us to do a thing, God. You have asked us to be a Job chapter 42 verse 10, a turnaround moment, God. You are ready to turn around the captivity. You are ready, Lord, to bless. But, Lord, as we pray for our, one another, our friends, God, I'm believing, God, that we are going to see a turnaround, God. There ain't a man or woman in this world strong enough to stop your purpose and your will. But, God, we have to be willing and obedient to eat the good of the land. So I'm asking you right now, God, open our eyes to what needs to be seen, Lord God. Open our ears to what needs to be heard. But, Father, let any false teachings, false doctrines, false beliefs, Lord, let them be exposed in the name of Jesus. Father, I'm asking you right now, Father, strengthen us and equip us for the days that are ahead. For we know that any time, Lord, that you bring change, Father, that there is a struggle between good and evil, Father. And I'm asking you right now, give us the strength and the ability to stand in the battle knowing that the battle is already won, that the, that the victory is already in Jesus Christ, Lord. Just give us the tenacity like Job had, Lord God, that around verse 4, 10 of 42, Lord. His captivity was turned around, and he was blessed with greater riches than he lost. He was blessed with seven boys and three more girls. God, I'm asking you right now, Lord, to just have your way, and let us be reminded that you are the God of restoration, and you will restore unto them the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, and the moth that's eaten, God, you will give back to them the years of harvest that were lost. You will give back to them the years of ministry that were forsaken, Lord God, because you are the God of restoration. So I'm asking you right now, Father, as we hear the word, let us apply it to our lives and let us work it with our hands and our feet and our lip service, God, that we may not just be hearers but doers of your word also. And, Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And God, all over the house to God we say, amen. I'm going to ask them to lead us in a song right now. These altars are open. If you need to come down and pray, you can come down and pray. If you need Jesus Christ to save your soul, please come see me.